hello and I'm delighted to welcome Benjamin Grovner uh, with me tonight here and uh, Benjamin is a great pianist I'm a huge fan of your playing Benjamin so thank you very much you. For, for joining us here um, so uh, first of all how are you and it would be nice I think to talk um, about uh, your um, recital that you just did at the Wigmore Hall recently how was that mm -hmm. oh, it was really lovely I mean you know I've uh been just at home now for three months and it was fantastic to have that to look forward to and to be able to go and play in that beautiful acoustic um uh it, yeah it was very a very special experience i felt very privileged to be able to do it and it wasn't too strange playing to an empty hall really i i, I found it very invigorating and, and quite moving mm -hmm. And of course, um, uh, you had, um, you know, your partner, uh, violinist. Uh, how how was this? How was the rehearsals? How did they go? Yeah, fine. I mean, we've been playing together for a very long time, and we met in two thousand thirteen, and we met through playing with each other. And immediately, we wanted to um, schedule more concerts mm -hmm. um, together. Um, so we've had a lot of experience with that, and um, it was, you know, just. Uh, I mean, what's been so oh, quite nice about the last three months is it's probably the in the uh, you know s s nearly seven years that we've been together, one of the longest periods of time that we've been able to spend with each other because we're obviously both traveling around the world and in and out of places. And um, she te she actually lives in Berlin; she's just visiting here at the moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, our lives can be quite complicated. So to have that time to be together and to, to explore music and then eventually to have this concert to look forward to it's mm -hmm. very special yeah fantastic oh, well um of course uh, you know you've um, um as i mentioned uh, really an amazing pianist so can we go back to your childhood and how did it all start for you uh, were you sort of straight away into the piano um not really i my, my mother is a music teacher and a piano teacher she you know she understands the value of uh, of children learning musical instruments and um, I have four brothers and we all she encouraged us all to learn something um, but we all chose completely different instruments um, my eldest brother played the trumpet and then next one down was uh, violin and guitar and then clarinet and guitar and then my closest sibling has down syndrome he also learned the piano for a bit um, and uh, and I chose the piano. I don't remember why. I mean, the piano was always in the house. My mother taught in the house, so I, I heard it a lot. And uh, when I was five, I started learning it, but was didn't have any didn't have a great interest in it. Um, I think I learned to read music in about half a year, but um, I couldn't. I felt it was obviously too young for me to settle down to really practice it seriously. So. Um, sort of started again when I was six and it went from there um, um, I mean yeah it wasn't it, I guess it wasn't sort of it, it wasn't so it wasn't love at first sight in many ways I um, it was when some friends at school started playing I was encouraged to practice just <laughs> with competitive instinct really I thought that maybe they'd get better than me and then I practiced a bit and because I put in that extra time and I had that motivation to put in the extra time, I was then able to play music that really satisfied me. And, you know, I played a waltz by Chopin and I think that's when it all started because when I was able to access that music and experience that, um, uh, it, yeah, it began my life as a pianist, I suppose. And sort of how old were you when um, really no one um, pushed you any longer to sort of to play more and to practice difficult bits and pieces? Um, well, I think from that point onwards, it was always something I enjoyed. I think, you know, I probably had to be reminded to practice, but I already, by I think by the age of 10, I realized that this might be what I wanted to do. Mm. You know, I might really? want to be a wow. concert pianist. So that was very early. So I guess from that, from that point, certainly the sort of um, the self drive was there. Yeah, sure. And then I had the BBC Young Musician coming just after that, which was a you know very positive experience and mm -hmm. gave me things to work towards and gave me you know great experiences of playing on lovely pianos and, and you know nice acoustics and things and eventually playing with an orchestra as well. So mm -hmm. it sort of cemented my um, inclination at the time. Mm -hmm. 
what did you find um, uh, difficult at that time? Uh, I don't know, any particular kind of technical challenge that you were not happy about or... Um, oh, it's hard to, it's such a long time ago now, it's hard yeah. to remember. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know, obviously I was, um, you know, what my facilities were growing all the time. I mean, when you're 10, you're, your hands are fully grown. So there's a limit to what you can do. Um, you know, I, I think towards the beginning of the BBC competition or shortly before I couldn't really stretch an octave, but, um, <laughs> So um, obviously there were limitations at that time um, and that um, obviously had an effect on what pieces I was able to pick for the competition. Um, and I mean, I, the, as I went through the rounds, I was obviously learning more repertoire. The biggest challenge was learning the Rivoli major concerto for the final. Um, that, um, yeah, that was, I remember that being a big challenge. Um, um but yeah I, I just i i got there in the end i suppose um why was it challenging uh, just the score or passages or um well it's quite an oty it is quite an oty piece especially in that last movement i guess that was i mean that was a challenging aspect to it um but also it's a i guess it's a you know, it's it's one of these pieces of Ravel where he's was inspired by many things. You know, you have the sort of Basque influence in it, and you also have this American jazz. So I suppose there's sort of it's sort of cult, it's this cultural hot pot in a sense, which maybe for a young person is not necessarily immediately easy to understand. And then of course there's sensitivity, uh, the second movement, uh, like mm -hmm. you know, sustaining the line of that. And glorious sort of un unending melody that he sure, produced sure. is a challenge as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I mean it's not a long concerto, and that uh, you know, there was a there was a time I don't know if it still is, but at the time anyway there was a something like a twenty five minute maximum yeah, for the piece right. that he mm -hmm. chose for the final. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, it's not it's not a long piece, but I think it has a lot in it, which is very yeah. challenging. Totally. Uh, interesting. And and so, um, were your parents sort of happy that you chose the musical career? Yeah, I think they were. I mean, my, uh, I think my, um, the music in my family comes from my grandfather, who mm -hmm. um, sadly passed away earlier this year. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, he taught my mother the piano. Um, he started my mother on the piano and then went on to me. And he really wanted to be a concert pianist. So he, uh, and he, I think he used to um, sort of bunk off school to practice the piano, but his mother um, wasn't as approving as my own. And uh, I believe one day he came home to find that she sold the piano, which is no. very, very sad. But um, he, uh, so in a way, I feel happy that I'm able to sort of live his dream for him. Mm. Um, and to have, yeah, parents that have been very supportive. I mean, you know, they they didn't, my mother didn't start any of us on the instrument with the expectation that we'd be musicians. She mm -hmm. just thought it was a good thing for us to do. So, um, and uh, I think at any point if I had said, actually, I don't want to do this anymore, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have had any problem with it. Um, <laughs> in a way, they might have been happy given how much they probably have had the sacrifice um, to and you know how much support and they had to give for my career um so uh, could, you, could you elaborate no. on that because that's interesting oh how did they, they support you um, especially interesting well my mother used to come to my piano lessons with me mm -hmm. um to make to help me uh, i guess up to about the age of uh, 16 um to make sure that you know to help me to understand what the teacher was saying and sure. to you know take notes and just uh, and um and then obviously she was able to help if i had questions when i was practicing um and you know she also came to concerts um mm -hmm. because i, well, I can go them can get them myself at that age and um so I, I also had her ears there um and you know there's a big investment of time when you're doing that and my, my parents sit down and my brother jonathan who has Down syndrome also had came to a lot of concerts as well. So, um, yeah, it, it's a it's a big investment of time, and it's something that I'm very grateful for. 
Sure, sure. I mean, it's of course it's very challenging also for parents this uh, this uh, sort of gift I think for for a child. Um, so, um, do you play with your siblings a bit or? No? no, they all gave up sadly. Sort of by the time I got serious with it, they'd all sort of put their instruments um, to one side. So there was never, you know, there was never really a family ensemble, um, which is a shame. Um, and um, but the biggest the biggest music lover in my family is Jonathan. And just sadly, he doesn't quite like the kind of music I play, but he loves <laughs> pop music and he loves dancing to pop music and um mm. so yeah a big music lover but he doesn't think what well, my music has enough bass he likes to okay. <laughs> prefers the pound, pounding bass <laughs> of pop music to what I'm doing. does it make does it make your left hand kind of uh stand out especially for for him sort of more more bass <laughs> yes I, I've, yeah. I've adjusted my technique over the years to really <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. uh, do you remember any concerts uh, that you were particularly kind of influenced by um, well, we used to go, uh, out, I suppose out of practicality, the hall that I was most familiar with when I was young was the South Bank Centre because we lived in Essex and um, um, my, my family didn't really like to go up on the train so we would drive and the easiest place to get to was the South Bank Centre because it's on, you know, you um, don't really ha don't have to go through the centre of London to get there. Um, so I went to a lot of performances there, often with my grandfather. I think some of my earliest recital experiences were with um, Louis Lorty, Stephen Huff, and Evgeny Kissin. Mm -hmm. um, I was a big fan of Stephen, and I still am, and of uh, Kissin as well. And um, uh, so they were the first piano recitals I went to. And I think I the first concerto performance I saw was uh, Pletniff playing Rack Three. Oh, wow. At the festival. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there were some of my earliest uh, concert experiences. Sure. Um, and uh, do you do? I mean, now it's of course impossible to go to concerts or to play concerts. But uh, do you do you usually go, or are you kind of so busy that there is no time at all in your schedule? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm in, a, in and out of London, I suppose. So. I probably don't go to as much here as I'd like to, um, but I, you know, I obviously love going to concerts and um, um, and I try to do so as much as possible. Um, something I often enjoy is um, when I played a concerto with an orchestra, they go into the second half and listen to the symphony because, um, you know, it can be really interesting because you, uh, I mean, you're not doing anything else then, um, <laughs> so there's the time, um, but you, you know, you get to know repertoire quite intimately mm -hmm. because, you know, there might be three performances and you hear the same piece three times. It's a way to expand your knowledge of the orchestra repertoire and it's a very fulfilling experience and also, you know, a way to get to know the orchestra more intimately that you're performing with and the conductor as well. But uh, I wanted to ask you, so of course, um, as a result of being a successful uh, concert pianist, you need to repeat quite a few um, times the pieces you play inevitably on tours. Um, so how do you find it? Uh, is it all the time sort of you try to think something different for the piece or is the mood that changes or? Um, I suppose, no, I, I, you know, it will be a bit different each time. I, I sort of don't try to force that. I mean, I don't try to think, I, I must do something differently today. I mean, you know, I, I'm sort of in a way grateful that we get to play, you know, pieces in a variety of circumstances. And obviously some of them can be, some of them can be really nice and some of them can be more frustrating. Um, if you, you know, if you like the piano or don't like the piano, and the same with the acoustic as well. Um, but it, you know, it, um, but it does, in a way, keep things alive that you you have that variety. Um, and um, yeah, on some pianos, some things end up working better or you might discover, um, you know, certain colors that you can't find in another instrument. And I think that in itself helps to keep things a little bit fresh. Sure. Um, I have a habit of, uh, sometimes I, I mean, I, I like to record all my recitals kind of from the wings if I can. Sometimes, often the sound is, Mm -hmm. you know terrible but um it can be useful and i don't i don't listen back to everything but mm -hmm. it, particularly for recital because it can feel it can feel very strange because you have this experience you go on stage and you play and um you haven't played with another musician so there's sort of no one to sure. give feedback so i find just having that 
you know, there in case I need it. If I want to listen to how four bars in, you know, in one movement of a sonata went, I can, I can do that and I can listen back. And I find that very useful. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, because some, some people absolutely hate it. I mean, it's quite a, quite a painful experience. I don't like it. I don't think anyone likes hearing themselves play. I mean, it's like when you, no one really likes hearing their own voice on, um, when they hear it recorded and played back to them. So I think it's sort of a similar experience. And I've had experiences where I've heard myself play and I haven't known it's myself for, for a little while anyway. And then you sort of, if you, you, you feel kind of embarrassed that you actually reacted to your own playing positively. And somehow, as soon as you know it's yourself, your perspective completely changes. I find anyway, it's a weird wow. psychological thing. Yeah. Um, but um, but I, I don't mind listening back to my past before, you know, to sort of my last performance in a sense, because I feel like it's a learning experience. What I don't really ever do, I mean, I haven't heard any of the CDs I've made since I made them, because, um, yeah, I, I, it's, you know, it, it's a... <laughs> it's a distant thing now and there's nothing I can do to change the fact that they're there and publicly available. So it's, <laughs> it's not really, a, there's not really a positive aspect to it for me anyway. Yeah. So I haven't done that. But uh, when you sort of record, I know there are two ways of recording. So one is when your producer really tells you this is great, like basically you're done with this. And the other is, of course, when you sort of say, I like that and I don't like this, let's take this take. And uh, so what type are you? Are you telling your producer, I like that, let's use this? Or does he tell you that sound is great? Um, it's different with, it, I mean, it depends on who you're working with, I suppose. I mean, with my recordings, pre, I, I, I'd actually say my, my performing, my recording experience recently with the Chopin Concerti had been quite different to the recording experiences I've had before because with my previous records I've really been quite hands-on with it and I wanted to hear mm -hmm. all of the material that was in the mm -hmm. in in the sessions and listen back and um and I, I've done that I don't think now that's a good thing to do okay. um and for the Chopin I um did my listening with the producer who's an excellent distinguished producer John Fraser um I did the listening with him in his studio pretty much and we heard the tapes together and I think that is a much healthier way to do it because you um because you know there is this kind of neurotic thing that you have as an artist about hearing yourself playing and you're not necessarily always the best judge of it and having someone else there listening and being able to say actually maybe you should reconsider this um can be helpful mm -hmm. yeah well interesting um you mentioned um of course um sort of uh, nerves and these funny things that one has in their heads. Um, are you a nervous performer? Not really anymore. I mean, I, I think going through it, because I, mean, I have been performing since I was very young, and I think I've gone through different phases. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I, when I was 11, it was the most natural thing in the world. And then, you know, you become a teenager and everyone becomes a bit more self-conscious anyway. And I think it became more difficult. Um, and then, you know, there were difficult periods, probably around the time when I sort of had my big break when I, in 2011, when I, I played at the proms and things, I think performing suddenly had quite a lot of pressure attached to it. But, um, and I, but over time, I just, yeah, I guess I got over that. And now, uh, yeah, I think just with more experience, I think the pressure that you feel tends to, at least for me, it's, it's, um, diminished. Um, so, but, you know, obviously you, 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 you get nervous, but not. I don't get nervous to the extent that it. I feel. I feel like it's a detrimental thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you need that. You know, you need that extra bit of excitement that the presence of an audience gives. Yeah. Um, but um, you mentioned that, of course, in your teenage years, you become sort of more self-conscious. Um, so uh, how did you cope with this sort of change? Because I know that everyone as a child can, almost everyone, play and don't think about it. Were there any techniques or did you, did you just kind of go past it, basically? I think I sort of just went past it, really. Um... Yeah, I can't, I don't think that there was, there was not a particular technique. I mean, I, I have used sort of at some point later in time, I, I've sort of tried some things to calm myself down. I had this 
I had this kind of realization when I was playing a concert, like in the middle of Yorkshire, in a, in a church, in a, in a lovely place. When then um, there was no piano to warm up on, so before the performance, I was getting a bit jumpy, and I went outside and looked at the view, and. I found that a very calming experience. And then after that, I found myself like before concert, trying to imagine that view in as much detail as I can. Mm -hmm. And for a short while that I found that to be quite a helpful experience. It was, I mean, I, I suppose a sort of meditative thing in a sense, um, um, you know, focusing on this thing, which is completely unrelated to what you're about to do sure. and trying to do so in quite a vivid way. Um, so the, uh, I think probably through the whole of my career, maybe that's the only technique that I've tried to adopt at one time or another to, mm -hmm. to help. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, and uh, going sort of um, back to your repertoire and your sort of performances, uh, you have a huge repertoire. Are you a quick learner? How long does it sort of take you to... Uh, I, I know there is not such a piece of generalization, but um, yeah fast learning type um um fairly i mean i know some people who i mean you know who can learn things so a lot faster than myself um and um you know i, I i'm certainly not a kind of john john ogden type um learner um but i yeah i wouldn't say i'm slow um um i mean yeah, I mean, committing things to memory, I think for everyone is always a bit of a stress and, um, you know, and that takes, it takes some time, obviously, depending on the music and the complexity of the music, it can be more difficult, but um, um, I, I, it's hard to sort of, to, 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 it's hard to measure this because it, yeah. each piece is different and you can say, oh, yes, I learned this piece in this long, but, and, um, but yeah, it's hard to quantify. Mm -hmm. No, but uh, the, the reason I ask, and this is what you mentioned, because, for example, if I talk for myself, I find sometimes, uh, um, like Mozart and Haydn, how do you remember that more, the more complex um, sort of compositions like Rachmaninoff or Ravel, because they're always changing, and let's say left-hand um, uh, Alberti bass or something could be, for me, it's like, it's just repeated, it's just the same harmony, so... <laughs> Um, well, I, I suppose, um, but, I mean, when I am memorizing something, I find work away from the piano to be very okay. helpful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe studying the score or trying to sort of uh, to almost play the piece in your head. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's important to sort of build up a kind of multi, uh, multi-faceted memory experience of the piece. So, you know, you're not just relying on muscle memory. I mean, by the time you perform... By the time I perform a piece, you know, I know it to the extent that, yes, I can sit and hear it and I can sit and visualize the keyboard as I would be playing it. And probably I can also sit and visualize the score. Sure. Um, so, uh, and, and also, I mean, you know, by the time you have a performance, you can, your fingers can basically do it without much thought anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't rely on that solely because that's muscle memory is most sensitive to um you know nerves and such things. so um yeah i've yeah I've time away from the piano to help to develop that very multi-faceted memorization of work is helpful what, what are your average hours um just on a non-concert day um Probably not more. Uh, it's probably not more than six hours a day. Um, probably. I mean, in, in, you know, in these days, I've sort of got into a pattern of doing maybe kind of three hours in the morning and then three hours later in the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, it's an, sort of another ni nice thing about this, you know, in many ways, unfortunate time that we're living in that there has been time to sort of think about um, practicing and what works because, you know, a lot of the time when you're in the midst of a touring schedule, you're sort of, you know, you're paddling away, working for the next thing, and there's not, there's not necessarily the time to reflect on it, you know. And I realised that I work best in the morning, so I try to do a good three hours in the morning for sure. Um, and then I, I, I find that I suffer from an after lunch slump, so I've been realising that um, that's a good time maybe to have a walk or to do something else. Um, and then maybe later in the evening, I might do the other three hours if I need to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, when I've been younger, there have been times when I practice more 
and yeah, I, you know, it depends how. It also sort of depends how much you have on your plate as well, and how much you're yeah. working yeah. on at any given time. Um, you've mentioned these weird times, and of course, it's uh, really strange. Um, so, how are these days for you? Are you working on the new repertoire? Are you trying to polish the old repertoire? Do you tackle things that you always wanted to tackle now, or? Um, well, I mean, when this all started, I, uh, I, 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 my, I mean, my immediate thought is, okay, I'm going to have some time away from the piano. And so I did, um, you know, I had two weeks when I didn't play and then I said, okay, I'm going to start playing again, but it was very hard to start. And I was maybe really? doing an hour, hour or two hours a day and didn't really go anywhere. And I thought to myself, well, what I'll do is not really do it until I really feel like I want to in terms of committing to really seriously getting back to it and eventually i did and i got back i got back to it and then started doing you know full working days of practice um and it was nice to have that time when i which i probably haven't experienced since i was a child of not really having to practice because there's always been something to work towards um and suddenly having this long period of time when i didn't have to practice play the piano was in a way quite refreshing um and when i came back to it again it was so nice to you know realize how much I needed it again um so yeah but then I I, I you know I worked on I'm, I'm working on things that um I mean it's obviously it's still a difficult time because um we're all hoping that in the autumn there'll be a return to some kind of normality but it, you know the, the reality probably is that a lot is not going to happen as it's planned um and so you still quite, don't quite know what you're working towards in the immediate future. Um, but I, I have been working on new repertoire for next season. Um, I've been working on a um, potential recording project. Um, I've been working on, I and mean, now, and now I'm at the point where I, I need to think about, um, you know, what of like concerti I have played before. I, I, in the autumn, I have a lot of dates with concerti I've played before. And mm -hmm. it's getting to the point where I need to turn my attention to them if those yeah, concerts yeah. are going to happen. So I'll start to let that repertoire um, come in as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, so it, very interesting that you mentioned a break. So you just went that you were tired or you just uh, really wanted to kind of say, OK, now is the time. Uh, and let's see if you like. Did you ever. My, my real question is, was it kind of you were giving it up in a way for this sort of um, period of time completely or was just like okay i'll just have a bit of break um i think i just i, I yeah I, I was just relishing the opportunity to have a break i mean i've always yeah i, I suppose for a while i thought to myself well, I, I had been thinking to myself well what would it be like if i if i didn't have to practice for a little while you know what would i do and in a way it was nice to it was a nice to have that experience um and um and then to yeah, and you know, and the, the eventual realization was it came to a point when it was like, okay, I really need to play the piano again. And just that realization in itself was nice because mm -hmm. you know, reminding us, reminding myself that you know, there's a reason why I do this, and it's not just a job. You know, I, I do it because it's really something I'm very passionate about. And the fact that I can have that time away, and then come back to it again and have that realization was in itself a valuable. Thing. Of course, yeah. Well, um, I just wanted to, um, to ask um, a couple of uh, really sort of last questions, if you don't mind. So what do you think is really the future of the classical music at the moment? Are you optimistic, less optimistic? I mean, you mean in the immediate future coming off the, out of the other side of this? Um, well, I mean... I, 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 I'm obviously a bit worried in this country. I mean, you see, I mean, because, you know, we're not, if you compare with Germany, for example, we don't rely, we don't have the same kind of government funding. And I think we, the arts need that. And I hope that the government steps up to provide that because, mm -hmm. um, you know, because you, you see in, you see in Germany now how orchestras are starting to program things and start to have performances and stuff to very little audience. So, yeah. you know, that, be able to do it without relying on ticket sales and i don't think we're able to do that here without um oh. without um greater investment um so um yeah uh, i think it's a difficult time fingers crossed that um yeah yeah that positive things happen and uh, any advice for younger pianists or aspiring pianists um, that are in this difficult time 
from you? Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to produce a sage little nugget of advice, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I yeah. I, I mean, I guess if they love playing, they should really continue playing. But uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's that's certainly always good advice. Yeah. I mean, you know, I suppose. Yeah. I, I found this time valuable to remind myself why I love what I do, mm. um, and you know, it's good to have had the extra time for that to be able to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look. Thank you very much. It's it's uh, been great talking to you and. Um, uh, look forward to hearing you soon, hopefully in the future. <laughs> Thank Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.